Hey guys, welcome back to Colum Audio Limited. Today we've got something a little bit different for you. I've got half an hour of uncut, unedited CNC footage of me doing some 3D machining work on this. We're going to have a chat about some of the CNC machining strategies I've used, why I've chosen them, and what I've been doing to allow us to get such beautiful chips. Come check it out and find out how we've done this and all the rest of them. Okay guys, diving straight in. We're looking at the spindle for our 3-axis CNC router. It's not got the right tool at the moment, so the first thing we're going to see is going to be a tool change. We've got a 10 position auto tool changer, so the carousel is going to pop down, it's going to come pull the tool out, the tool will unlock, it'll spin round, it'll put a 16mm ball nose cutter in. Everything will lock back up, the spindle is going to spin up to 18,000 RPM. This takes a little bit of time because there's quite a lot of mass to spin up in there. We'll get an M111 which will drop the dust hood down to the first position, we're going to wrap it over to the left. The first piece of cutting is not rapid, unfortunately. This is a, it doesn't seem it, but it's a fairly complicated um, simultaneous three axis motion that it's going through for this first bit, which means that it's trying to move in X, Y, and Z at the same time, but it's outputting, I've managed to output like 50, about 15 lines of code per second. And the controller, which is from 1998, is just choking up. It's just like, ah, too much stuff. I don't know what to do. And it panics and slows down. And then it gets around to about here and it picks up and it's like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. Oh yeah, I'm a CNC router. Right, let, let's make some chips. So as I said, 16 mil ball nose cutter. We're just going to do some roughing for the beginning bit. So I'm sure you can see at the top of the model, there are four fairly distinct slices of plywood. 18 uh, mil birch has been used throughout this. There's four slices that have kind of only got 2D contours cut into them. Conversely, the bottom five slices, I think it's five slices. There's some 14 mil slices in there. It's weird. Don't, don't ask me why. Those have had the 2D work and then the 3D work done on them as well. I've broken down this, this 3D machining into two sections simply because if I was to try and buy a cutter that was long enough to reach and do the whole thing in one go, um, yeah, I, I think I'd end up with a ridiculous diameter to, to stick out ratio and I'd end up with all sorts of problems. I'd end up with like tool vibrations and I'd end up with a horrible surface finish. Also, the cost of cutters was just going up and up and up uh, as I went up the sizes. So like I say, 16 mil ball nose, this was 200 quid. Um, there were 20 mil options and I think 24 mil options, but it was just, it was just getting towards silly money. So I opted for this. So why are we, why are we roughing? What are we doing? What do we mean by that? Why are we not just cutting in the, the final geometry? Well, there's a lot of excessive material in there. And even though it's a, a 60 mil diameter tool and it's made of uh, solid carbide, and it seems really stiff. There is some deflection in there. There's some deflection in the machine. If I was to just hack through the material and try and hack out that, that final shape, what we'd end up with is a final shape that vaguely resembled what it's meant to be at the end, but it wouldn't be quite right. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to go through and rough it out. So I've told it to, I kind of said to the machine, here's the surface of the model that you're trying to cut follow that surface but just stay two millimeters away from it and take your cuts fairly aggressively space them out quite wide just just do some kind of bulk material removal so as you can see it's kind of working its way around through these four quadrants here um hacking away at stuff the the actual depth of cut here while it seems like quite a lot it's still less than one times d um with a, I think I was going for about a five mil step over here. So it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty healthy cut considering the stick out. Um, but the cut, if I could unpause the audio, you'd find that actually it was, um, the cut sounded fine. I was getting some really good consistent chips off it, even though it's choking up on code every now and then. We're not getting any burning. So the, the cut is not kind of dwelling and it's not rubbing and burning that, that would dull the carbide. So, why did I employ a constant cutter engagement strategy right at the top? Well, for the life of me, there was a ring around where the baffle is. What you can't see is in kind of the top dead centre middle of this, there's a big circular cutout. That's where the driver sits in. There's a baffle. So the kind of the circumference of that, I just couldn't make the cutter cut around that in the way that I wanted it to. So I had to employ a separate tool path just to do the top 
just to do this top little section of roughing and tell it to hack all that out. What I'd usually go for is um, like parallel Z contours. So it would just work around at one Z level, doing everything at that Z level. Um, and then moving down, as you can as you can clearly see here, it's it's dropping down and the it's doing X, Y, and Z all at the same time. That's why it's it's choking up a little bit. Hopefully, in a minute, we'll we'll head round to the point where we're we're doing the simultaneous three. So yeah, still going, still going. It's a shame it would have been nice to have the dust hood up a little bit further so you could see a little bit more. At the same time, it would have, might have been nice to have it down so there was some actual chip evacuation. Right, here we go. So this is what I was aiming to do. So there's only one uh, Z decrease per, uh, kind of per circumference it passes around. So what that means is as it's whizzing around here at 12,000 millimeters a minute, it's able to run really nicely and quickly because it's not it's not choking up on those lines of code you see it's just absolutely obliterating this stuff i was uh it's it's a fairly new phone that i've i've used and i've and i've bolted on to kind of inside the shroud of the cnc machine and i was watching it i was watching the machine making sure it was being sensible and i could just see everything getting absolutely peppered with the most fantastic chips um really 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 impressed with this cutter actually uh, it's lasted really well it's done quite a lot of these and i've accidentally run through a couple of nails with it um in the past i used to use almost exclusively onsrud cutters uh, a lot of their coated series but i found them to be really expensive and while they were good the cost didn't quite match up to the quality um, so I, I started moving away from Onstrad and I found a company here in the UK called EMST, uh, East Midlands Saw and Tooling, and I've been buying quite a lot of their cutters recently, and I asked them for one of their um, big ball nose cutters, and they said annoyingly they didn't have it in stock, or, or any of the other sizes that I asked for, and they were like, look, we'll, we'll sort you out, there's a company called Calibre, I think they're Italian, uh, so this is a Calibre brand tool. Um, yeah, been been thoroughly impressed with this. I actually got quite a lot of ball noses for this project. I got this 16mm, I got a 10mm, I got an 8mm and a 6mm, all at these kind of extended lengths. And then I got a, a really, really long 6mm. It's like 120mm stick out that was meant to, if you can see the rectangular, the vertical rectangular slot, um, the the internal corners there. I wanted to reach down in there with this long cutter. I just I just couldn't make it work. There was there was too much run out in it. The run out was about equal to the uh, the chip load per tooth. So I just murdered some plywood and, and gave up on that. Um, and then I dropped it and snapped it because it's a 120 mil six mil ball nose cutter. So yeah, <laughs> gave up with that. Starting to build in a little bit of a pucker factor here. That uh, that was getting a little bit close. So we're going to do a pretend drill cycle that just forces the machine to move off to one side. What I found early on is when I did a couple of these tool changes, when the tool changer drops like that, uh, it crashes into the workpiece and rips all the tools off and the machine gets very cross with me. So over to a 12 mil compression cutter, an EMST cutter. I'm going to wrap it back over after the dust hood drops back down. And we're going to start cutting in the, uh, the rebate for the driver. So I can never remember conventional climb milling. We're, we're cutting kind of clockwise for the inside geometry and counterclockwise for the outside. So what that means is it can it can just it can stay at depth here. Uh, so rather than having to pull out to do both sides, um, it's not actually that much material we're taking off here. I think it's only about 15 mil depth that we're taking, but I decided to take it in three passes. So a couple of reasons. Uh, unfortunately, due to the way these um, these laminated assemblies got put together about here um, and sometimes here, there ended up being nails in the assembly. So I thought I'd just use this cutter. It's an old one. It's a beater. It's pretty knackered anyway. I just run it gently so it can clear out those, those nails um, and that would be a nice and easy way to do it. 
after cutting through the first two nails, I'd absolutely destroyed this cutter. You, sh you should see the state of it. I, I didn't think it would keep cutting, but it's the only one of these I had in at the moment. And I thought I'd just keep going. So I thought gentle, just a couple of passes, just a little bit of material at a time. Uh, it turns out it actually left a surprisingly good finish considering the state that it was in. Um, even the floor finish on the bottom of the pocket was quite good. The only problem was it had chipped off the sharp corners, so there were no sharp internal corners. So we'll see in a, in a minute or two. I need to come back in and finish it. So you can just see me here running through again, roughing out this section here. Um, because the plywood I bought in was so thick as well, um, is a little bit over 18 mil. It was between 18.3 and 18.5. I wasn't quite sure exactly how thick this assembly was going to end up. So it looked like there were a couple of cuts there that were air cutting. I didn't know how thick this was going to be. So I thought I'd just kind of err on the side of caution and, and just, just go gen gently, gently and let it work its way through. So it's just going to repeat what we've just seen on the other side um, before it jumps back over to the side um, to do another tool change. So yeah, if you can kind of imagine it being down at this height and the, and the carousel coming down above it, we saw before it just, yeah, it rips the tools out and I had some fun sorting that out. Okay, so finishing up that, yep, it goes over there, it pretends to drill a hole. All that does is it, it just, it just gives me a G1 in one place so that I'm there and it'll give me my M6 for my tool change before it does the next G0 to jump back over. So 8mm compression cutter, um, this is actually an Onstrud cutter, although this is the last one in the batch I've got of the Onstrud ones, after this I'm switching back over to the EMST stuff. So again, that's going to do a G2 or G3, that's running at, I think, uh, maybe only 9000 millimeters a minute, and that's a finishing pass. So that takes us right to our finished dimensions. Again, yeah, we'll nip back over, do the thing, change the tool. That eight mil is one of the odd ones out. Actually, it's actually in a in an ER forty collet. As you can see, it's it's a much smaller collet. Still, still ISO thirty. Um, it's just some of the funny stuff that came with the machine. Okay, so again, you've got to spin up to eighteen thousand RPM. It takes a little bit of time. So we're going to do pretty much the same thing again, but instead of a roughing cycle, we're going to do a finishing cycle now. So same again, for love nor money, I could not persuade it to cut around kind of the periphery of the baffle cutout that we just watched that 8mm and 12mm forming in there that we can't quite see, but we know it's in there really. So I'm employing another constant cutter engagement toolpath that just doesn't seem to keep the cutter constantly engaged. I was not really sure what was going on here. It's meant to keep it at depth. I think it's due to these hemispherical cutouts that lead down to these rectangular slots that we can see kind of the front of the body closest to us. That just gets in the way and it, it forces the, the cutter to mostly work in kind of four quadrants before it finally gets to a bit that it can do a full circumference of. As you can see here, so it kind of goes round and it gets to a bit and it's like, oh no, I can't do that bit. I need to lift up again. Very annoying. For a program of this size, and this length, so this is 27 minutes, this this has taken. For doing big runs of these, we, we're making eight of these, it is actually worthwhile me trying to reduce the time it spends uh, rapiding. That's why, as it's rapiding, it's only, you know, it's only about 10 mil above the work surface uh, to, to shave off some time there. Not really sure what it's doing here, There's some just some fine finishing stuff. When I did the first one of these, I, I had my cusp set uh, quite large, so I was still getting a fairly ridged surface, which was not really what I wanted. I wanted to really minimise sanding time on here. If you look down towards the base of the part, you can see all the, the stripes, stri stripes, that's a mix of stripes and striations, stri ugh, striations, is that the word, right word? I think so. You can see the stripes are quite close together towards the bottom, but as the angle uh, decreases uh, or increases as it gets towards the top there, those stripes get wider and wider apart, and there's a really constant kind of uh, striped profile around the front, particularly on that top front face that we said we can't quite see here. 
Now, if I start sanding that a lot to remove all the ridges that are left by the cutter, I quite quickly change how those stripes are shown. Um, so I decided it was best to, to really take my time. And that's why this bit seems to be cutting in the same place just over and over and over and over again uh, to get them really close together. So it looks to me like it's it's completed that it's a it's a constant cusp tool path that it, it will have completed and it's moved on to the um the horizontal Z contours. So what this is doing, it takes it essentially takes a slice in the Z axis, so the top of the model's about 150 mil, so it takes a slice at 150 mil, it traces the profile in X and Y, and it tells the cutter, right, just just whiz round that in X and Y. And then when you get to a particular point, drop down in Z a tiny bit retrace it and whiz round again. I think it's about here. I think it's I think it's on that left hand side at what would be about nine o'clock. I think you can see it pausing and dropping down there. I don't know. Let's see if we can is it here? Yeah, yeah, you can you can just see it drop down there. Um it continues on its merry way. So the rest of the video is pretty much this this going round and round and round and round and finishing all that off. So maybe now's a good time to tell you a little bit about the CNC machine, where it's from, kind of what, what we're doing, how we've programmed it, and maybe that'll take us towards the end. So as I said, this is an SCM, it's a Record 220. It's a much older CNC machine. Um, it's from 1998, it is only a three-axis CNC machine, but what's particularly nice about this is it's got two beds. So what you can see down in the bottom left as as we come back over the MDF sheet that you can start to see on the left hand side that's the beginning of a full eight before sheet um, so I can get two sheets of material on this at the same time this allows me to do something called pendulum machining where I can set up one sheet of code and put two sheets of plywood on the machine on the left and the right hand side of the machine and to do all the cutting on one side of the machine and then it would move over and do all the cutting on the other side of the machine. But while it's doing the cutting on the other side of the machine, you clear all the parts off the first side, you clean the bed down, you put a new sheet of material on. And then when it's ready, you just press the vacuum on button and the start button and it moves over to the other side and moves back to side one, starts doing that. And then you start unloading the parts from the other side and you kind of have this, it, yeah, it's pendulum. You just move backwards and forwards. And what it means is you're not wasting, you've not got downtime where the machine is idle when you're unloading parts. That's a, that's a massive way to kind of decrease spindle, spindle up time. That's kind of the name of the game. That's why we bought this machine. It's a high efficiency, high productivity, high output machine. Um, allows us to do a lot of machining uh, quite quickly. It's helped by the fact that it's got a particularly powerful spindle. So it's got a 10, uh, 10 horsepower spindle, um, 10 position auto tool changer, ISO 30 uh, tools, which we've got a number of pre-set up. So while it's only got the 10 positions in the tool changer, we've actually got space for 30 offsets in the controller. So I can have up to 30 tools set up. And when I when I call up my tools, uh, so I can go M6, uh, T1, D1, so M6, do a tool change, T1, select tool, tool 1 in tool position 1, and then D1, use offset 1. I could equally do M6, um, T1, D11, that would call up um, like the next... Um, the next preset for that tool. So I've got tools one through 10 and D one through 30. So while I said we often do pendulum machining, you'll be going, ah, oh, but Callum, I can see straight through to the metal bed here. That's, you know, that's not got MDF there. How do you put two sheets on there? Well, we don't do that much of it at the moment. This is kind of, um, that's for the, the quantity of work that we want to be doing in the future. For the time being, we do a lot of panels that have a lot of second side operations. So this right hand side of the bed, we use mostly for second side operations. The L shaped bit of 12 mil plywood you can see at the very bottom of the frame and are moving over into the left of the frame there. That's our positioning jig. So we can put a panel in there and we can square that up and that those edges have got known locations in X and Y. Um, this machine has got a vacuum bed as well, so you can see the aluminium bed, or you can just about see see it. Uh, it's getting covered in chips. There's tons of vacuum ports through that that we can undo and we can apply like a neoprene rubber gasket. 
and we can vacuum down parts. We've even got some vacuum risers, some like little metal blocks that are surrounded by rubber, so we can lift up parts off the bed and we can do work right down to the sides. And that's that's generally how we tend to locate parts on this second side. So this jig that we're fixed down to at the moment is is both bolted and vacuumed down. Um, the machine's got this fairly neat feature where if in kind of the safe startup block for the G code, I put in an M38, it, it looks for a vacuum check um, on the right hand side of the bed anyway. It looks for a vacuum check, it's an M28 for the left hand side. What that means is it's drawing vacuum at this side and there's a, a vacuum pressure gauge and you can set a, a minimum vacuum. So it'll pull the, M, it'll pull the M38 and if there isn't enough vacuum there, if the parts aren't fixed down properly, it won't allow you to start the program. This is really nice. So if you, you know, if you don't have a workpiece on there, if you hadn't finished setting up, for instance, if something's not right, it doesn't launch straight into it. What we, what you might have seen at some point is in some of the rapids over to the right when we do the tool changes, um, there's a small block that you can just about notice. Um, that's raised up off the bed that says on on it. So while this jig here is permanently vacuumed down, that M38 would kind of be pointless because it would always see correct vacuum because this section is vacuumed down. So what I've done is I've got another open port with a block on top of it. So whenever I'm setting up the machine, I take the block off and flip it over and it says off on the other side. So if the program were to start up or for it were to still be running, Sometimes I work with noise cancelling earphones in and I don't hear the machine when it starts up. Because that block's taken off that opened up vacuum port, it would look for the vacuum and go, ah, the, the pressure's too low, so it won't do it. So yeah, that's that's why we do that. So as we can see here, it's it's starting to work its way down now. It's moving reasonably quickly. And we can see that it's it's cutting away those those much uh, much more distinctly ridged sections and is leaving actually a surprisingly good surface finish. There are still some minor ridges, you can just about feel them with your fingers, but it's so so little that it will realistically it will sand off very, very quickly with, with minimal fuss. Particularly because this is all end grain, it'd be really tough to sand um, if we were gonna spend ages and ages and ages sanding it like I say the first one I did I, I pulled it off and spent blinking ages sanding so I thought no let's let's take the time let's let the machine run this is what it's here for so you'll notice even though we're going through doing a finishing pass even though we're taking what would be pretty minimal material removal we're actually still getting consistent amount of chips coming off. You can see they're, they're constantly flying off. You can see good piles of good thick chips everywhere. There's no dust. There's no dust at all. My feeling is for this kind of stuff, and part of the reason we can get such good surface finishes and so consistently, is that if you're getting dust off, you're not, you're not cutting enough material. So even though this is a finishing pass, rather, you know, I could have left half a millimetre of material so that this tool really wasn't deflecting. I've left a good two mil, so it's got something to really go at. In the kind of the metalworking CNC machining world, there's this idea of um, chip thinning. And I'm not sure, I've never found any literature directly relating this to woodworking. But my understanding of chip thinning is when you are employing some sort of cutting strategy like this, you're trying to get a particular a chip per tooth, a particular feed per tooth. That is to say, per revolution, each time one of the flutes come round, it is biting out uh, a set amount of plywood. And by altering the, the RPM of the cutter and the feed rate, you can dial in a fairly specific chip per tooth. Now, if that's too large, it starts tearing, you start getting deflection, you start getting bad surface finishes. If it's too thin, your tool starts rubbing and if you don't have enough stock to leave on your roughing pass when you come to your finishing you get this chip thinning effect now I think I'm using this correctly and this, this phrase correctly you end up with a really thin chip it's not really a chip that's coming off it's just dust and the tool is rubbing and rubbing generates heat and heat kills carbide and then you end up with rubbish surface finishes anyway and I've already said this is a 200 pound cutter um, so we'd be we'd be running out of cutters pretty quickly. This cutter's done eight of these now, and it it just looks it looks perfect. 
Um, same with all of my cutters. I, I go around some people's CNC shops and I have a look at their cutters and they're all black and gunky and burnt. And it's like, what, what are you doing? Turn your RPM down or turn your feed rate up a little bit. So that's that's kind of that's one of the the tricks that we employ for a lot of our CNC machining is ensuring there's enough stock to leave so that the cutter's got something good to go at. When you're metalworking, that that good chip formation is also important because you're thinking about pulling the the heat from the cut out, and the the chip almost kind of wicks away that heat. Uh, and again, pulls the heat away from the carbide. Now, potentially, there'll be an air blast or or coolant or or uh, mist coolant or flood coolant as well if you're doing metal cutting. But that's you know obviously with woodworking, we can't do that. Um, so I don't. I've ne again, I've never found any literature supporting this or uh, indeed going against this. But I've always wondered if maybe having a good chip means that the wood chip pulls some of the heat away as well, so it's not building up in the cutter. I've never really been able to test that. Sometimes when I've done a long, a long run of cutting, I'll go and I'll feel the cutter and the tool holder, and they're often warm, but they're never hot. Um, so yeah, I'm unsure on that one. If you've if you've got any thoughts or comments on whether you think um, chips in wood uh, do pull away the heat, then yeah, please please leave some uh, comments down below. I'd I'd love to hear. So you can see here we've, we've gone past that fourth layer line. We're actually working down just below. Because we've got a 16mm a ball nose, obviously I, I decided to tell it to cut to uh, within the radius of the cutter below the uh, the meeting line uh, in Z just to ensure that the two separate sections uh, kind of mate up nicely. And they do, actually. I was, I was really proud of that. There's almost imperceptible. There's the block. Did you see it say on? Right, it's going to pretend to drill. It's going to change over. Um, <laughs> do some thoroughly bodgy drilling. So I realised a little bit too late. Um, I needed to put some eight mil holes through for some insert nuts. So this is a five mil dowel drill. It's changed over to because I've only I only had a five mil left over. And Parker Factor, this gets a little bit close, and you can't see it. Yeah, it was scary the first time we're doing that. I realised I didn't have enough length on my drill because all my drills are set up for drilling through 18 mil, and this is through 18 mil, but like 15 mil down in a rebate. So it pre-drills everything with a five mil drill, and then the only other long eight mil tool I had in here was a long eight mil ball nose. Now, obviously, the centre of the tool of an eight mil ball nose is is not for plunging. Um, so by clearing out the centre of the hole with the five mil, most of the way ish. When we switch over to the 8mm ball nose, ah, oh, you don't want to hear the audio for this bit, this is horrible. Ugh. Sorry, sorry everyone that's watching and going, you're drilling with a ball nose, why are you doing that? You shouldn't be doing that. Yes, I know, but it was the only thing I had. So that'll whiz over. And we've got enough length to properly go through that. We're going reasonably slowly as well. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And that takes us nicely through to the end finish off drilling those holes and it'll wrap it back over into the corner and we're done i hope you found this small insight into some of our cnc and some of the thoughts for how we do things i hope you found this interesting um if you like this camera position and you'd like to see more stuff narrated like this let me know in the comments i'd i'd love to do more of these i find it quite interesting i like i like nerding out about this stuff so thank you very much everybody um like comment subscribe all those all those things that you're meant to do that you're not meant to ask people to do at the end of the videos yeah Thank you very much, guys. I'll see you next time.